Good afternoon, everyone. The topic uh, for this session, as Will also mentioned, is, is international commercial arbitration. It's a topic that's important not only to the present generation of Australian lawyers, but also to future generations. With increasing globalisation, an increasing number of disputes are and will be of a transnational nature. And this has implications for the profession. The overwhelming preference of commercial parties is to resolve such disputes by international arbitration. This is because of the superior enforcement available under the New York Convention, which has the force of law in 151 countries around the world. Basically, an arbitral award rendered in a New York Convention country is enforceable in other New York con Convention countries subject to very limited exceptions which do not include error of law or error of fact. There is no equivalent enforcement regime at the moment for court judgments. So it's not surprising that in the international dispute arena, litigation is ADR. For some time, uh, in light of this irrevocable shift in the way that commercial disputes are being resolved, our neighbours in the Asia Pacific, particular the, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong have devoted substantial effort and resources in establishing themselves as dispute resolution hubs. Australia was, has also taken steps to do so. Have we done enough? What more can we do to attract international arbitration to, to Australia? So, for example, between uh, Indian parties and Indonesian parties or any other foreign parties. And what can we do to promote the services of Australian practitioners, barristers and solicitors in international arbitration seated outside Australia in the Asia Pacific? To explore these questions, we have a distinguished panel of speakers. Um, they are all known to you. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, give you some snippets uh, from their profiles. On my immediate left, we have Justice Middleton of the Federal Court a former chairman of the Victorian Bar Council and uh, a member of the full court of the Federal Court and some of some important international arbitration decisions in the past 12 months. On my far left, we have Justice Croft, who amongst other things is in charge of the arbitration list of the commercial court of the Supreme Court of Victoria. And prior to his appointment to the Supreme Court, uh, he had a substantial arbitration practice, including uh, in the area of international arbitration. On my immediate right, we have Bronwyn Lincoln, a partner of Herbert Smith Freehills in Melbourne. Uh, she has uh, substantial experience in international arbitration, uh, using different forms of arbitration rules and uh, is uh, a member of the Federal Attorney General's International Legal Services Advisory Council uh, and chair of its uh, International Commercial Dispute Resolution Committee. Uh, uh, next to Bromman on, on the right is Peter Meegans, a former partner of Mallison's in Melbourne and now uh, for some 18 months a partner of King and Spalding in Singapore where he specialises in international arbitration. Peter is an experienced arbitration practitioner and arbitrator. And on my far right, we have Martin Scott, QC, Chair of the International Arbitration Committee of the Victorian Bar, co-chair with me of the Arbitration and ADR Committee of the Commercial Bar Association of Victoria, a board member of the Melbourne Commercial uh, arbitration Mediation Centre, which has recently been established and uh, with experience in conducting arbitrations, especially involving Chinese parties. So can, perhaps I can kick off by asking Bronwyn, uh, following a, a consultation process that began in November 2008, the international arbitration regime in Australia has been reformed. Can you uh, update us on Australia's scorecard since 2010? Thank you, Albert. 
I should say that I think that we've come a long way in the fact that we're sitting here today at a conference which is essentially law in practice in the courts and we're talking about international arbitration just shows how far we have come, that it is part of the accepted um, determination process in Australia and, and outside of Australia. Um, I wanted to approach this topic not just looking at the amendments to the law but looking also at how we've developed uh, the environment in Australia that makes it more conducive to help us uh, develop the practice in Australia and also promote Australia overseas. So I I'll just very briefly look to those two perspectives. So the 2010 amendments, which many of you will be familiar with, so I won't go through in any detail, but essentially they brought the International Arbitration Act, uh, the Australian Act, um, up to date with what was expected and best practice around the world. Um, it incorporated the 2006 uh, model law. Um, it included objects to the Act, which were very important, and it, um, it resolved some of the issues that had arisen in jurisprudence over um, the previous decade or so, perhaps even longer. Um, a few decisions which were a little inconsistent with what the international community was looking for, um, and perhaps a little surprising. So uh, international arbitration is one of those areas where you find that the practitioners from around the world are looking at what's happening in Australia, just as we look at what happens in other jurisdictions around the world. So it's really important if we're going to promote Australia um, that we say to the world we're getting it right and we have a good legislative framework in place and the support of the courts. So it was very important for that reason. And in parallel with it, it commenced the process to clearly distinguish how you um, proceed in international arbitration as against domestic arbitration. So again, that's important to the rest of the world because dispute clauses are advised upon and recommended by lawyers in large part, including in-house counsel. And if they're looking to Australia and they don't understand what the processes are and how we apply the law, um, then they're going to look elsewhere. So we've made big, big progress on that front. We've also seen, as Albert mentioned, uh, the uh, centre in Melbourne, which was opened in uh, March this year for mediation and arbitration, and that runs in conjunction with the um, Australian International Commercial Centre in Sydney, Dispute Centre in Sydney. Um, so we have um, ideal facilities now to, for arbitration to be run. So if there are parties from um, outside of Australia or inside Australia looking for a centre, then we now have those in Melbourne and Sydney, and there's further talk to develop a national grid. I think Perth might be the next, um, the next in line. And it's interesting, Neil Kaplan, who's a, maybe known to many of you, a very distinguished um, art international arbitrator, spoke at a Monash University function earlier this year. And he emphasised how important it is to actually have a physical centre when you're going to develop international arbitration. And he talked from his experience in Hong Kong, where he said the centre started and then arbitration followed. So I think that we've done well on that front. We also have Akika our Centre for Commercial Arbitration. Uh, we have, they have excellent arbitration rules. Akika has done a huge amount to promote Australia. Um, it's recognised it has uh, cooperation agreements with institutions around the world. It goes out around the world and tells them about Australia. Its new rules from 2011 incorporate the um, emergency arbitrator provision so you can get uh, interim uh, decisions from an arbitrator appointed in less than 24 hours have expedited rules. And I think that the role Akika is playing um, is indicated in part by the fact that the regional institutions such as the Singapore Centre, the Hong Kong, um, the International Chamber of Commerce, the London Court of International Arbitration, are all sending their representatives to Australia now to do regular roadshows. And you just wouldn't have seen that five to 10 years ago. So they're recognising the potential in Australia. They're talking to the end users, business people, and they're talking to lawyers. Um, so all of that bodes well for us. I know we only have a few minutes, so I just wanted to turn to the second perspective for a moment, um, which builds very well on the previous uh, panel's discussion because it seems to me that in creating a landscape or an environment where we can promote international arbitration and put Australia on the map, uh, that there are a couple of aspects of the way we conduct civil litigation which can be translated into the arbitration. And one of the concerns about international arbitration, which is being um, 
uh, spoken about all over the world by clients is that it, it has delays, it takes a long time, it costs a lot of money. Um, and the fact is, it often does. Uh, but having said that, um, the Queen Mary College and uh, PwC do a regular survey every couple of years on users of international arbitration. And, and that's what they say. We still see it as the preferred means of resolving international disputes for the reasons Albert spoke about. But it costs a lot of money and it's not always efficient. In Australia, we're very used to mediation being part of the litigation process. In international arbitration, you don't see mediation nearly as often as I think you should. It's very well suited to resolving disputes where you have parties from different cultures. And I think there's a big opportunity for Australian practitioners um, to actually introduce mediation um, because there's no stigma attached now to saying, let's mediate. The courts tell us we have to. We do. Um, and it's highly successful. So there's an opportunity there. And I think the second opportunity, which may be a little um, novel, but we don't impose on parties to an arbitration agreement obligations akin to those um, the, of the overarching obligations that were talked about previously. Um, it seems to me that there is a chance for us to now say to um, advising clients, what about in putting some of those obligations into your arbitration clause? Um, what about agreeing up front, well before there's any dispute, that you will cooperate, that you'll act in a particular way? Now, it's not, not the answer to everything because you'll have international arbitrators who won't be familiar with our process here and the obligations imposed on parties and clients. But I think that there, there's scope to explore that. And I think that Australia is in a fantastic position to actually translate that in and introduce a new commerciality into international arbitration, which is what parties are calling for. Thanks, Bronwyn. Perhaps I can turn the discussion now to our distinguished judges and start with, um, by saying that, an, as Bronwyn alluded to, an important consideration for commercial parties when selecting a seat for their arbitration uh, is whether the, the courts of the, the relevant jurisdiction are arbitration friendly, namely uh, whether they are supportive of arbitration as opposed to being uh, unnecessarily interventionist and whether their decisions are predictable and in line with international arbitration jurisprudence. Justice Croft, Croft have you observed any discernible shift in the judicial attitude to Australian courts towards arbitration in the past few years? Uh, well, thank you. Yes, yes, I have, but I think that's something to be considered in a broader context. Uh, Bronwyn has referred to the legislative developments, and that's been very, very significant. We now have, at Commonwealth and state level, state-of-the-art commercial arbitration legislation based on the model law, um, at, and that's very important as a, as, as a legal basis, legislative basis. At a number of conferences around Australia and the Asia-Pacific in the last few years, I've been discussing a number of very important decisions from the High Court, the Federal Court and our Supreme Court, which have sh clearly shown the direction of Australian courts is towards continued and increasing support for arbitration. One case I, I will talk about if I have time is the recent Court of Appeal decision in Flint Inc. against Hutamaki Australia, which explores uh, some of the derivative party aspects of the International Arbitration Act. But it's, it's to another area of the role of the uh, which the courts must continue to play in supporting arbitral awards, which I wish to turn to. It's no understatement to say that the continued success of international arbitration in this region will depend significantly on the level of assistance and support for arbitration and its processes provided by the courts, together with the enforcement of its product, the, the arbitral awards. The judicial approach taken by courts to challenges and to enforcement of international arbitration awards is important in many ways. From an economic point of view, a country where the courts are inconsistent in their approach and unpredictable in their treatment of international arbitral processes and awards does not and is not likely to attract any significant arbitration work. As past surveys indicate, and I'm particularly referring to the Queen Mary College surveys, parties usually select the governing law first, followed by the arbitral seat and then the arbitration institution and rules in that order. This concept of consistency in judicial decision, decision making is one which I believe, believe is of the utmost importance in establishing Australia as a preferred seat for international arbitration. As a federation, achieving a consistent body of jurisprudence in respect of the interpretation of the model law 
is no easy task, with concurrent jurisdiction conferred on eight state and territory supreme courts as well as the federal court. Despite any difficulties which may arise, developing a consistent approach across all jurisdictions is imperative for the continued growth of arbitration in this country. To this end, it is important to bear in mind the position of the two most established arbitral seats in our region. Both Singapore and Hong Kong are unitary legal systems and each have developed an approach to arbitration where a select number of judges with arbitration experience hear arbitration related matters at first instance and on appeal. With the role of judicial interpretation of arbitra arbitration legislation being placed in the hands of a small group of judges with the relevant experience, the chances of establishing a consistent jurisprudence is greatly enhanced. The establishment of specialist arbitration lists is one measure that can make a significant contribution to the achieving of consistent jurisprudence within our legal structure. I've previously identified a number of benefits of establishing such lists. It's worth noting some of these now. Namely, they promote consistent and predictable outcomes in arbitration-related matters. They facilitate the development of a reasonably consistent body of arbitration-related jurisprudence by a single judge or a small number of judges with expertise in arbitration in line with global arbitration jurisprudence. Three, they facilitate consistent and expeditious procedures in arbitration-related matters. Uh, four courts with specialist arbitration lists are well-placed to communicate and receive feedback from commercial arbitration stakeholders. Uh, next, the existence of specialist arbitration lists promotes dialogue between courts in a federal system so that they may develop and share arbitration expertise and experience. And finally, the existence of, a specialist, of specialist arbitration lists with specialist judges provides a focus for the purpose of educating arbitrators and practitioners. Now, at this time, the only uh, Supreme Courts or the only courts with uh, specialist arbitration lists are the Supreme Courts of Victoria and New South Wales. It's hoped that should this development occur within other, within other Australian jurisdictions, the greater consistency in, in judicial decision making in arbitration matters will serve to strengthen the attraction of Australia as a seat for international arbitration. In the meantime, mention should be made of the good work of the Akika Judicial Liaison Committee, which has been assisting helpful communication between arbitration judges in various Australian jurisdictions. Another issue which is also important in developing a consistent approach to judicial support for arbitration is the consistency in the manner in which parties are able to enforce arbitral awards across different jurisdictions. While in the past there have been a number of differences in the procedural steps that one must take to enforce an award in different jurisdictions, it is pleasing to note that significant developments have been made to bring a uniform approach to the procedural rules which must be followed to enforce an award. Using the current federal court rules relating to arbitration as a model, a number of state supreme courts are in the process of modifying their own rules with a view to creating as uniform procedure as possible. I don't think I'm giving any secrets away to say that I hope the Victorian Supreme Court will uh, publish some new arbitration rules within the next couple of weeks. It is cooperative steps like this which must be taken to ensure that Australia is able to develop a national grid of arbitral hubs, as the development of the grid will be a key platform for this country to continue to grow into its role in uh, world arbitration. We talk about the courts and assistance from the courts, but I do want to emphasise the point that it is a combined effort and, and I, I, I want to stress that uh, uh, it should be remembered that the reinvigoration of international and domestic arbitration in Australia cannot be achieved by governments or courts acting alone. Governments have now made a crucial contribution to the process by procuring the enactment of substantially enhanced arbitration legislation uh, uh, internationally and domestically. But the responsibility for this reinvigoration falls on all of the various commercial arbitration stakeholders. Commercial parties, lawyers, whether they be corporate, in-house, barristers or solicitors, arbitrators, arbitral institutions, uh, the state and territory governments and the courts to ensure that Australia is an attractive venue. A failure to, pro to position ourselves in this way carries the real risk of the country being marginalised in terms of international arbitration with very significant effects in terms of uh, well, our, our trade and remembering that we are a trading nation. Finally, if I just make mention of the Melbourne Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Centre. An example of the benefits of this collaboration 
is the establishment earlier this year of the Melbourne Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Centre. The centre, of course, is very much in its infancy, uh, but its establishment has brought to Melbourne a world-class facility in which to, to conduct arbitrations and mediations. This has only been possible by the close cooperation of representatives from uh, the various major arbitral <coughs> institutions, the State Government, the Victorian Bar, the Law Institute and the Supreme and County Courts. It is only by everyone involved working together that Australia will be able to establish itself with its grid of arbitration centres as a major centre for international arbitration. And if you haven't seen the centre, I suggest it's, it's worth going and seeing it in the William Cooper Justice Centre. So that's probably all I need to say. Thank you, Justice Croft. I now move to Justice Middleton. An important feature of the international arbitration system is that an international arbitration award is final and conversely not open to attack for uh, error of law or error of fact. Yet we've seen in Australia over the last few years uh, attempts by uh, litigants to attack arbitral awards, in effect backdoor attempts to re-agitate facts, factual findings and to attack errors of law, uh, invoking the public policy exception to enforcement in the, um, in the, in the New York Convention. Have the, the courts been successful in stamping out these sorts of attacks? I don't know if we've been successful, but we're trying as best we can. Um, some of you will be aware of the decision of the full federal court in TCL air conditioner and Castle where issues like this did arise. Um, what, what is difficult, uh, particularly at trial level, and that case is a classic example of this difficulty, is preventing parties from raising every issue of fact and every issue of law again and re-agitating it at the enforcement level. And, and what you need is, I think, a strong judiciary and trial judge to say, well, I'm going to stop you I'm not going to spend three days going through this. This is not the exercise that the review court is undertaking. Um, now that, that has been helped, I think, by this full court decision to give trial judges uh, a backing to say that that's what we, we should do at that particular level. So I think the courts are aware of that problem, but it's a matter of giving sort of uh, a trial judge some ammunition and the trial judge him or herself having a bit of a backbone to, to deal with it that way. That also means appellate courts have to be supportive of a trial judge who approaches in that way, which in my view as a matter of principle is the correct way to approach it. Um, can I just say in relation to support generally and, and, and those issues of how far we go, I, I, I think greater reliance now is placed upon decisions uh, as Justice Croft has referred to uh, outside the English tradition. Uh, the, the old principles tended to be that the court would uh, scrutinise a lot more than the current position uh, amongst our neighbours in the Asian region. And I think the, the new position is, is one now of uh, hands off unless you really have to supervise in the way in which the legislation intended the court to supervise, uh, where really there was a dramatic mistake or error made. Uh, in, uh, based upon whatever he want, wants to call the unruly horse of public policy and other grounds. So to answer your question, I think yes, uh, it's there. It's a little way to go yet. I think we've got to have, as I say, appellate courts supporting the approach of trial judges. Uh, if I could, thank you, Judge. And if I can now move to Peter Meegans. Uh, Peter, you've moved from Australia to Singapore uh, 18 months ago. And, and practising in international arbitration. Can you give us an, uh, an update on the development of international arbitration in, in the Asia-Pacific region and, and what this means for Australia? Now, I know you've prepared a, a PowerPoint with 37 slides that you're going to cover in less than 10 minutes. So I've been, I've been given a mute button. The, the words I 10 just minutes you. ring in my ears, Albert. Um, <clears throat> just very briefly, I've moved to Singapore to practise in international arbitration. I practise with a firm by the name of Ken Spaulding which is a large American firm that specialises in international arbitration, in particular in the energy sector. Um, one of the things that has struck me very much about that move is this, that if you're moving into the region, you really need a base where you have work. And that means going to a known firm which has got that work or having um, someone in that firm, as we're lucky to have in John Savage, who's one of the major players in the area. Um, to give you an idea as to why I say that, um, 
I'd recently found out that there are between 131 and 149 foreign firms just in Singapore where I'm based, and they're vying for this work. Um, the ones who are doing well are the ones who've got a reputation. Um, the attitude of the Singaporeans is also very interesting. Um, typically, uh, and one of the judges in charge of the arbitration list there sees a lot of practitioners. In one month, she saw 40 British silks come through her chambers to introduce themselves. Um, they came through, and they come through in droves to try and gather work in that market. Um, the attitude of the Singaporeans is very simple to all practitioners, not just Australians. Everyone is welcome, but bring your own lunch. Don't eat ours. And I think that's a fair enough attitude. Now, to give you an idea of the sort of work that's going into this, I'm going to try and do a quick PowerPoint, but this is very quick. This material is in your papers if you want to look at the figures. Let's see if this works. Right, it does. There are three centres I'm going to look at very quickly, Kuala Lumpur, then Hong Kong, then Singapore, and I just want to give you a bit of a travelogue to show you what's available. Um, Kuala Lumpur is the most recent. This is what it's got. It's an old Sharia court building. It's got 19 world-class hearing rooms, 15 breakout rooms, a business centre, um, extra-large hearing rooms with transcription services and the like. Here's some of the facilities, the reception area, um, one of the resting areas, um, one of the dining areas, one of the hearing rooms, Again, another one of the hearing rooms. Um, a breakout room, another breakout room, and an auditorium. Now, you can see that these are not third world facilities. They spent a fortune uh, putting these facilities into action. Um, they get a lot of work from in the Middle East and from Africa in particular and from Muslim jurisdictions. Next is uh, some of the figures they've given. The figures are a little bit misleading. The, I'm not sure why the bars on the extreme right are higher when they show less cases. I think it's meant to show a trend, and that is that the workload that uh, Kuala Lumpur Regional Centre for Arbitration, or KLRCA, is servicing is growing. Um, next, we'll have a quick look at Hong Kong. Sorry, I'm getting a sore neck doing this already. Um, Hong Kong is one of the most established centres in the region. It's been there for a while. Um, it is um, currently handling 260 new arbitrations in 2013, 81 cases fully administered. It gets a lot of work from um, mainland China, and it boasts that none of its awards have ever been disallowed in main, mainland China. They say if you go to Hong Kong and arbitrate there, you'll get enforcement in China. So not surprisingly, it's popular for Chinese work. Now, its facilities. It's actually on one floor of a high-rise in Hong Kong, and it is a little bit um, less modern than Kuala Lumpur, but as you can see from the slides, again, we have uh, modern facilities, modern hearing and breakout rooms, and... Um, quite a good venue. Now, that was a very short trip through Hong Kong because I wanted to get to my hometown now, Singapore. And Singapore is without a doubt the leading centre at the moment in Asia. Um, it attracts a lot of work, and we'll come to that at the end of these slides. The front of this building is Maxwell Chambers. It's an old historic building. This is the rear. It's been renovated in a modern fashion. You actually come in through the rear. Um, this is a taste of one of the hearing rooms that you get in Maxwell Chambers. They come in different forms. There are 13 of them. One of them set up like the House of Lords. If you come from a British background and you want something old-fashioned, you can have it. If you want something modern, you can have it. If you want something that looks like a spaceship, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've missed out for some reason on the reception area there. I just want to give you a quick overview of um, the sort of statistics that come out of um, SAAC, established in 1991. It's got 259 new cases so far this year. It uses arbitrators from all over the world. Um, it's got a judiciary which is very sympathetic to arbitration. And I can't, under, I can't overestimate or under, overstate enough the fact that this is crucially important. You need a sympathetic, cooperative, supportive judiciary. The other thing you need is an independent judiciary. And uh, that's something that Singapore um, sells itself on. Running through a few more of the statistics, this shows the growth in their caseload. And this shows the countries where the cases are coming from. And what you'll notice is that Australia produced 11 of the cases last year, but look at the growth in caseload from um, various areas like India, China, but also USA producing more cases for Singapore than, in fact, Australia is producing. Um, a breakdown of the caseload, corporate, shipping are the biggest areas, construction is quite large, trade commerce is quite large. Um, total aggregate sum in dispute is $6.6 .6 billion Singapore last year, make that about $5 billion Australia. Um, it also now has an emergency arbitrator facility if you want something quickly, uh, and an order from the courts quickly, or from, sorry, from an arbitrator quickly in support of a remedy that you need urgently. 
Am I going for time? She's doing well. Yeah. Okay. We, um, uh, now, the other point I want to make about uh, this area is do not underestimate the extent to which foreign practitioners are active and compete with you. Every week I get flyers across my desk from all three centres telling me what's on. This is one I got last week from um, the Singapore Academy of Law and Essex Court Chambers, a London group of chambers. They actually have offices in Maxwell Chambers. They're putting on a mooting competition. Next week I'm sure we'll have a, a competition on something else or we'll have an essay on good faith in contracting or latest practices in arbitration. There are English silks and barristers through this area all the time touting for work. Kuala Lumpur. It's got to rise to the occasion, so what does it do? Here's a flyer that came across my desk last week for a seminar, and knowledge and ad adjectival law and key to succeed, successful trial appellate advocacy, put on by Lincoln's Inns Courts and KLRCA. Um, the region is expanding and booming with international arbitration. The message for Australia, I think, is this. If you want to be active in this area, you need to be committed to the region, you need to be seen in the region, you need to go out and work in the region. It won't happen quickly, it's difficult. Um, I'm in the fortunate position where I'm with a firm that had a reputation and a leading practitioner. Um, that doesn't mean you have to have it, but it'll be a lot slower if you don't. Why is it important? There's another initiative that's just coming into the region, and that is this. Um, the Singapore courts have just set up the Singapore International Commercial Court, which will provide independent high court services for litigants who want to have their commercial disputes resolved by a regional court. It already has a cooperation agreements with some Australian courts. It hopes to rival the London courts as the international court of the region. It'll start next year. It'll invite foreign judges to sit on the court. Matters will be referred to the Singapore International Commercial Court um, by the existing judges of the Singapore High Court. But in addition, the parties will be asked to write clauses into their contracts providing for matters to be referred to the Singapore International Commercial Court to determine the matters. This is their next step on from arbitration. There will be right of audience for foreign practitioners who are admitted to the court. It's worth watching out for. In addition, Bronwyn mentioned very briefly the Singapore International Mediation Centre. I uh, sorry, mentioned mediation. Singapore International Mediation Centre is the next venue or venture that the Singaporeans are working on. It will be launched in two weeks' time. It will try to introduce into arbitration and into the Singapore International Commercial Court a process of mediation which will almost be compulsory. So the region is embracing mediation. Um, my message is, if you want to be part of the future in this region, you really need to get into this sort of work. Thanks, uh, Peter. I can now move to Martin. Um, Australia, unlike other centres such as Singapore, suffer from the, the tyranny of distance. Um, in, in that respect, how realistic is it that we can attract international arbitration work to Australia? Uh, well, I think uh, everybody who's spoken before me uh, has identified elements which are obviously critical to um, what I'm going to speak about briefly. Um, uh, uh, the, the point of the attempt to make a catchy phrase about attraction, repulsion and propulsion is that it covers all of all of the three elements that we've heard about. Attracting work to Australia from uh, other possible um, dispute parties like India and Indonesia, as Albert suggested at the outset, is not unrealistic and I'll try and explain why. I don't think the field has been vacated to any one venue or seat, whether it's Singapore or elsewhere, but it shouldn't be underestimated uh, the uh, extent to which hard and organised work has to be done and, and I think in our natural way uh, because we're not uh, uh, run by the state in the way that places like Singapore are we, we don't organise things on the same way and with the same intensity that may actually turn out to be a benefit depending on uh, what happens in Hong Kong in uh, the months to come. Um, repulsion is, the, is my way of summarising what historically the perception at least of the approach of the courts in Australia has been towards arbitration and I think that can be put to rest not just because Justices Croft and Middleton have said it can be put to rest although I believe them but because it really is a distant memory I think now for um, participants in arbitration in Australia and the message that everybody in this room should be broadcasting uh, if I may suggest is a positive message about the extent of the support that arbitration gets from the courts in this country and 
the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court of Victoria, New South Wales and the Federal Court of Australia have said repeatedly that uh, those three courts in particular, and they're the main courts which deal with arbitrations, um, uh, on message and support of and will make the resources available. Now, contextually, just as an anecdote, you may be aware of an emergency arbitration in New York, I think it was last year, between Microsoft and Yahoo. There was a deal between Yahoo and Microsoft where uh, they were going to share essentially a database um, and Yahoo tried to walk out. Uh, the a notice of dispute was issued immediately for emergency arbitration. A judge in the trial division in the circuit court in New York district heard and decided the case within seven days and the appeal uh, commenced 14 days after the decision. So that's the sort of competition that the courts in our system are facing. It's 21 days in New York, and probably, I don't know, but it'll probably be even quicker in Singapore. Uh, from what I hear, uh, you can confidently broadcast the message that the Australian courts are on message. Propulsion is just my attempt to rhyme with the second word. Um, <laughs> how do we engage with the region? And it picks up on something that Peter said that's absolutely fundamental to understand. It, we, the days of us as practitioners being parochial uh, in a state or city basis, of course, are a generation ago, and being able to do it now on a national basis is uh, a fast fading memory for many people. The reality is, in the Australian diaspora of law lawyers around the world, particularly in this region, like Singapore, like Peter, demonstrates conclusively uh, that there is no such thing as a border in dispute resolution anymore. And um, uh, <coughs> the reason uh, is the first point on this slide. Uh, Chief Justice Alsop has recently observed, and with respect I agree, that the clear future for significant commercial dispute resolution in this country is arbitration. Albert touched on this at the outset. The practical reality is uh, that as uh, uh, Australian uh, and foreign companies, and particularly Australian companies, become more aware of and familiar and comfortable with arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism, they will come to understand uh, that uh, a lawyer who um, does not include an effective arbitration agreement in a transactional document is bordering on the negligent. Uh, because of the enforcement difficulties. Um, and that's a sentiment that's been emphasised by a number of prominent international arbitrators, Australian international arbitrators, for some time. Um, that means that there's a paradigm shift in the service delivery because you'll no longer be uh, competing with the work uh, with somebody down the road in Melbourne or in Sydney. You'll be competing with Peter for the work. Um, and that's an ominous prospect. He's a very competitive man. Uh, and everybody else in the global world of global trade and dispute resolution. Now, if that's an intimidating prospect, uh, I think it should be seen as that, but it's also a great opportunity because the borders don't just fall one way, they fall two ways. Um, uh, and the multidisciplinary point is simply just to observe, for those of you who haven't had exposure to it, I, it's a mistake to assume that the norms of dispute resolution that we're familiar with through the courts here apply in terms of the service delivery in international arbitration. They don't. Uh, uh, Peter's firm, of course, is an American firm and practices on the American model, so the advocacy tends to be in-house almost universally. Uh, the English model increasingly uses a sort of hybrid sort of arrangement depending on the firm and the preference of the practitioner. That's being seen tentatively now in arbitrations in Australia uh, with some firms where practitioners have had that experience. Um, and in some jurisdictions, for example, uh, in the Middle East, and I expect this will move easterly in our direction, you may find all sorts of people with all sorts of qualifications advising and advocating. Um, the advantage that we have is that we operate in a, in, a, in, a, in a region where the common law and the common law basis of representation is uh, recognised and the economies and the legal systems are sophisticated. But, um, it's a mistake to assume uh, that there are no competitive threats uh, except within the profession. My awareness point is really to do with the quite striking uh, variation in comfort and familiarity in our profession with arbitration. Uh, I, I don't mean to be unkind, but you do have some surprising conversations with people who have no real idea what arbitration is. And if they have any idea, they tend to make the assumption it's basically just a carbon copy of litigation for the sort of reasons that Bronwyn has touched on, I think, the um, arbitration should be seen, in my view, in a practice sense, 
as all the same whether it's domestic or international in terms of its norms because the object should be to make the most efficient, consistent uh, method of, um, of conducting the hearing and getting to the hearing and formulating the dispute and um, its resolution. Because the distinction between domestic and international arbitration may be fascinating to us as local lawyers, it's of no interest whatsoever to anybody else. Um, so conformity and suitability for the particular uh, context of the dispute is what it's really all about. Um, which is not to say, as Bronwyn observed, that a lot can't be taken into arbitration from our side, uh, from other practices that we have. Um, the reputation point I'll just pass over. It really has to do with uh, the fact that there are some extremely prominent Australian lawyers in arbitration, both as lawyers, advocates and arbitrators, and uh, then there are people who, uh, without doing the work to become sufficiently um, expert and familiar um, just do the work and that creates difficulties and the classic example is where they bring inappropriate and out of date practices from commercial litigation into the arbitration context and that's the competency point as well. I've got something to say about competency and I know I'm short of time so I'll move on and come back to a solution that I suggest. Um, the strategic outcomes point is simply really picking up on Peter's point. Whether we like it or not, uh, it's a global market for services and commerce and we are along for the ride. Uh, there is no doubt at all that we have a choice whether we participate or not, but the outcome will not, the outcome in commercial terms, in terms of the shape and size of dispute resolution practices, and I would venture to suggest front end practice to a certain extent as well, is not something that we can control. Uh, so it's not a, an old fashioned Queensland thing to put up the barriers and hope it goes away. It won't work. Um, regulation has been modernised. Uh, we, we all know that, we can all read the Act, we can all read the articles and see how uh, much better it is. We've got the MCAMC in Melbourne. Uh, if you haven't looked at the website, I encourage you to do so because it's not just uh, a description of what the facility is, it's also a hub uh, for all of the other ADR facilities in that area of Melbourne around the William Cooper Centre. It's an exceptionally good website, it has a booking arrangement and all the rest of it. I'm spruiking it because the physical presence does matter and using it matters and uh, as Peter's uh, charts showed, even Singapore came from a relatively low base. If you took all the ad hoc arbitrations that uh, happened in Australia last year or the year before uh, and compared them with where Singapore started and certainly where Neil Kaplan tells me Hong Kong started uh, 20 odd years ago, it would be roughly comparable. Now they have some advantages and we have some advantages but the point is there is a solid base. The problem is we don't have an aggregation of data or statistics, so we don't know. They do because uh, their arbitrations all flow through the same, tend to throw, flow through the same facilities. We're in a similar position to, I suspect, New York City, where they have a beautiful arbitration centre, which is paid for by the leading uh, Manhattan firms, and which none of them use, uh, because they like to keep it private. And the significant statistics um, was brought home to me by something an historian wrote about uh, the 20th century. If you took the start point and the end point of the 20th century and asked the simple question, did the Japanese and the Germans have a good century, the answer would be yes. But if you knew the statistics about what had happened to those two countries during the course of that century, your answer would be mixed. And it's the same with arbitration. It's very, very subjective, the perception of the strength of arbitration in Australia. The health of the arbitration sector is much better than some of the pessimists would say, uh, but we do need to find a way to be more collaboratively engaged to share information uh, about what's going on. Um, competency and training, uh, there are lots of different ways of doing this. The bar, for example, runs a free CPD program uh, where we come out uh, as best we can and do CPDs in-house for firms, um, usually during lunchtime and we do things like run through the International Arbitration Act and, and that sort of thing and talk about recent cases so that uh, practitioners who may not be dealing with it all the time can feel engaged and feel up to date. It's a very useful program and if anybody is interested in that then they're welcome to contact me or contact the, the bar office and we'll make some sort of arrangements. The presenters are uh, barristers of uh, usually mixed seniorities who do practice in the area and do know what they're talking about. The Law Institute, in my view, and the Bar generally 
uh, and collaboratively need to do more of what we're doing today, uh, but also to do it offshore in places like Singapore to engage with uh, the community there so that we start the journey of integrating ourselves and understanding how we're integrated into the region. We're not alone. Everybody's in this position. I touched a moment ago on Singapore and Hong Kong and where they started. Um, uh, the, the Americans are having a similar dilemma, although albeit not an in international arbitration, where they're very obviously very strong, particularly around uh, New York and Washington with investor state arbitration. But um, uh, you know, their domestic arbitration seen as a mess, and they openly talk about it being a mess. And they have the same issues that we have, the universal issues about cost and delay and competence of arbitrators. And the solution to those problems is adequate training. It's support of things like the MCA, MC and of Akika, it's easy to do. And uh, think about joining uh, a, 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 a solid training body like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, which is at the moment run by Albert in Australia and runs some exceptionally good, exceptionally good training and education programs. Um, well, uh, we all know that um, uh, Somebody important in Singapore clicks their fingers, it happens overnight, and the law changes. Um, on reflection, I'm not so sure that we quite want to live in a <laughs> place like that. Um, but it, seriously, if you've got the essential elements of the support of the court system, uh, the independence of the arbitration system from the state can also be seen as an advantage. Um, and uh, uh, we have some disadvantages, uh, distance, um, uh, lack of cohesion and organisation at the moment. But these are things, distance can't be fixed, but the other things can. And there are other attractions that we've got that can be, that can be sold. The public infrastructure and courts and all the rest of it, others have spoken about. And obviously there's a high focal point of competence in those places. But as I said earlier, um, every law firm I've visited in Hong Kong and Singapore has, certainly the, the English language, foreign ones I mean, has a, uh, uh, a very strong Australian presence. A very strong Australian presence. <clears throat> uh, now, um, I've mentioned Yahoo and Microsoft because the Americans are very, New York courts are very proud about it. They talk about it a lot. Um, uh, I, I don't think I really want to say anything further about any of this except to say that we need to find a way forward and I don't want to take any more time. This was my, um, if I still had your attention at this stage, question about w what is wrong. You hear, I hear from, including from prominent Australian arbitrators who practice internationally, some surprisingly um, negative things. It's a long way to come, even though they live here and they come here all the time. Um, it's actually no further than a lot of other places, it's, and it's easy to get to, and it's got all sorts of other attractions, the competence of the local profession, the, easy climate, the, uh, the physical comfort, the um, infrastructure. Um, there's no reason for a, an Australian uh, corporation ever to lose an arbitration overseas uh, for any of those sorts of reasons. Uh, what's more important, I think, is the point that Peter was making that I've articulated is do we belong? Uh, uh, I've travelled extensively um, in uh, Southeast Asia and China for arbitration uh, work and uh, spent a lot of time talking to local professionals about their perceptions of us. And the perception is something that won't be new to anybody here, it's that we don't behave like we belong. Um, I've never met anybody who said you don't belong or you're not welcome, uh, but uh, there is uh, the perception that we are inward looking and not willing to be engaged. I think it's changing because of the um, inevitability of seeing more and more Australians uh, for business, but I think the profession uh, needs to find a way, and I don't have an answer to that proposition, but they needs to find a way to physically be there more often. Um, one of the results is the unconscious prejudice that I've got there. When I say look left, or up left, right, but not down, what I mean is they look to the Americans, they look to the Europeans, they even look further north in Asia, but they almost never look down here. Unless there's a follow the client element, um, which there can be in places like Singapore, uh, we're not front of mind. And when challenged on this, most people there would, would just simply not have a reason for it. It's just familiarity 
And the fact that there are you know, 20 or 20 million English silks going through every day um, says a lot about the state of the English bar, but it, <laughs> it doesn't actually reflect, reflect uh, for example, an element of cultural cringe in Singapore towards England. It's just, it's just an awareness and presence thing. There are, in fact, I think four or five sets of English chambers who nominally at least have physical premises at Maxwell Chambers. There's even a set of New Zealand chambers, but there's no Australian presence at all. And um, uh, to me, that's astonishing. And I think the only people who are more surprised about it are the Singaporeans. They can't quite understand that. Um, uh, it can change, but it has to be done in a very particular way, and I've got some suggestions on the next slide about that. Martin, mm. two minutes. I've got two minutes, then I'll stop. Um, You've got to be aware of short PowerPoints. You, you, you do. It just gives you too much liberty. Um, so, fly in, fly out? No. You can fly in. You don't have to live there all the time, but you do have to be there all the time. You have to find, we, all of us, have to find a way of doing that. There are some ways that it can be done. It actually doesn't take a particularly large collaborative or cooperative group to do it, and it's not ruinously expensive to do it if you think about it and organise it the right way. But you do have to do it, and I think everybody who's thought about it for long enough thinks that. That solves the second problem. Then you're not just following a client or on an occasional basis, or here's my business card or brochure, and aren't I wonderful, and away you go. Um, there is an obvious attraction to Australian uh, interests, for example, in having Australian representation. And if uh, there is going to be a dramatic increase in arbitration in the region involving Australian interests, either out of the courts here, so no longer in court here at all, or even leakage of arbitration work presently here, then uh, you need to be, we need to be familiar with that place, familiar to the profession there, otherwise you won't, we won't get the first chance to do it. That's the organisation point. Um, and then there's the plan point. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> What's the plan? Who's got the plan? Uh, the Victorian Bar, I'm happy to say, is working towards a plan, and we hope to have something which we uh, implement in conjunction with the ABA, which Will austrian has been working on uh, um, hard in recent months in particular. It's premature to say anything about it, but it's sufficient to say that it wouldn't take a lot to uh, get the existing structures we have, and off the back of those, uh, build the sort of engagement in the region that I think we need. Yes, thank you. Uh, Martin Bromman, would you like to comment or raise I, anything? I did just want to add one thing which I think um, is quite important and I overlooked before, but is consistent with us putting ourselves out there and uh, telling people about what we can do. The International Council for Commercial Arbitration um, runs a conference every year on international arbitration and it's widely accepted as one, as one of the most significant events on the arbitration calendar. Um, in April this year, Australia and New Zealand uh, were successful in a bid to host that event in 2018. So that's um, something to aim for and a huge opportunity for us to showcase Australia. Um, just to give you some indication, the competitors were Hong Kong, Moscow and Kuala Lumpur. So um, we really are playing on the world stage in that area. Now, I'm conscious that we're standing between you and, you and lunch and we've been uh, gently encouraged to finish. But can I just ask Peter just a, a concluding comment? Uh, yeah, just very quickly on um, Martin's presentation. And I can now yeah, speak a little bit more slowly. It helps. It's not pushing me. but. Um, the future of Australia practitioners in Asia is a very big question. And um, the fly-in, fly-out model, I think, doesn't work. I did it for many years from here. I found it difficult to do. It works to an extent. You can pick up Australian business going into Asia or the odd dispute here or there, but you won't be thought of for the actual Asian-based work. Um, we are a long way away. That's the reality. If you're here, you're physically a long way away. And it's interesting now, living in Singapore, that people rarely think about Australia. It's as simple as that. It's the place down south. Most of them have holiday houses here. But when it comes to work, they don't think that much about Australia. And in part, I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. They've constantly got the British and the Americans in their faces. And that's because a lot of them have gone to university there, but um, that's a reality that we have to face. Um, but the other thing that's interesting too is they do see us as competition. We're seen as a little bit as sort of the big brother who, if left to our own devices, will take this work away from them. And they want to be ahead of us. And it's very interesting for me that uh, there was an arbitration in town recently where Alan Archibald appeared. 
And the town was abuzz with how good this Australian silk was in this arbitration. And it was almost a case of, he's a bit too good for us. So I think we can really match it there. There's no doubt about that. I think um, Australia can succeed there, but we shouldn't go in there actively competing. We should say we're here to add something to the pie. We'll bring our own work, we'll assist, whatever. And I think you'll find that they're a very, um, a very warm and receptive audience. And I think my experience is the other, region, the other centres in the region, Kuala Lumpur particularly, also Hong Kong, are the same. Um, we're welcome. The question is how do we sort of exercise our entree to make that welcome into something positive for us? Thank you, Peter. Justice Croft. So just very quickly, in similar vein to Peter's comments, and I think very encouraging, I was speaking with a leading uh, arbitration, uh, Singapore arbitration silk at an answer trial conference in Seoul towards the end of last year. And he said he couldn't understand why the Australians hadn't come. Hmm. And, and, and they were both worried and thought that would be good because they were very impressed with the quality of Australians and uh, they were concerned about their own work but just couldn't understand why we hadn't taken it like the English bar had. So I think the message clearly was, and I thought the comments uh, by the panel, that it, it, it is there for the taking if we can get our act together. Th uh, thank you. Now, there's been much food for thought in this session. Can I just leave you with a quote from Charles Darwin, who said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the, the one that is most responsive to change. Can you please thank our panellists in the usual way? Um, thank you, Albert. Thank you, Your Honours, um, who I know both, I think, been in court this morning. So thank you very much for coming down. And also to Peter Megans, who is probably flying the furthest of anybody to be here today. Um, and Peter, it was great getting your insight and your knowledge, particularly about Asia. Uh, Martin Scott's right, we are very, trying to be very progressive at the Victorian Bar and I know in the profession in Victoria, so much so that we urge the ABA for the first time to actually have a part of a conference as part of the Malaysia International um, Law Conference in Kuala Lumpur last month, which was very successful and it was interesting being one of the participants to see how the Malaysian Bar and the Malaysian profession reacted to having Australian QCs there and um, so much so they've now asked us to sign a memorandum of understanding with them to progress it. Uh, we've been invited to by the Chief Justice of the Singapore Supre uh, Supreme Court, sorry, the Chief Justice of the Hong Kong Supreme Court to attend and make presentations there on behalf of both our bar and our profession. And the ABA is very much taking this mantle and running with it. Um, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Allsop last year said to us, as far as he was concerned, having recently flown internationally, that his view was over 80% of, of, of disputes, both national and international, will be dealt with by arbitration in the future. It's a staggering figure and one we have to be very much aware of. Martin's also correct in saying the Victorian Bar has got um, practitioners available to provide in-house um, CBD conferences. We would like to be involved and if you'd like to know more about that, please let us know. Please thank our panel very much uh, for an excellent session and lunch is served upstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.